First Baptist Aztec, and thank you for joining us in person or online. I'm Beth, and I'm so glad you decided to spend your Sunday morning with us. If this is your first time here, Pastor Mike would like to meet you outside the north doorway after service, where you will receive your favorite soda, candy bar, and a gift. Before we get started with worship, here's some things happening at First Baptist Aztec. Our next quarterly business meeting is this afternoon at 4 p.m. You will hear some of what God has been doing and how your church family has joined him in his kingdom work through ministry reports and updates. Hope to see you there. Now, before we go any further, I don't want the language arts department to get ahead of me. So, the math department wants you to know that quarterly, quarterly, that is four times a year, Now, quarterly doesn't have to mean per year. It can mean per week. A quarter is in a dollar, so there's only one out of four in a dollar. Now, here's what you need to know, and this is really cool, so watch. Everybody should know what that is. That's a division symbol. When you divide, I don't know if you knew that these dots actually represent something. This dot up, up here represents a part, and this down here represents a whole. So a quarterly business meeting would be one out of four business meetings. And if this is a division sign, which it is, and a fraction, which it is, you can divide from top to bottom to find out the decimal. One divided by four is, I hope you said it, 0.25, which is exactly the same as a quarter. Malvina Cox will be leading a Bible study Monday mornings from 10 o'clock to 11.30 a.m. starting Monday, January 24th on learning to pray for your husband. Wives, join Malvina in submitting your hearts in prayer for your husband, for the father to move in your life, and for your husband's heart. Simple ways to pray daily for your husband in marriage will be shared each session. Sign up in the first cafe or contact Malvina with any questions. We will be helping FBC Cortez with a baptism service on Sunday, January 30th at 3.30 p.m. in Cortez. Some of our worship team will lead worship and Pastor Mike will do the baptism. After the service, we will have a potluck and a fellowship with the members of FBC Cortez. You are encouraged to join us as we celebrate the baptism of a new believer. Whiteout is a winter retreat for students who are currently in 6th grade through 12th grade. Students will be encouraged to the gospel message, engaged in meaningful worship, and get some time alone and with their group to process what God is doing in their lives. All paperwork and money is due in the office by Wednesday, January 26th. See Beth Lee if you have any questions. Tuesday time of prayer will resume February 1st from 5.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. Join us, if only for a few minutes, as we seek the Father for a spiritual renewal in the region, for God to draw people from the north, the south, the east, and the west to himself, and for people to discover hope, healing, and a church to call home. Ladies, bring a friend and sit with Madison on Saturday, February 12th at 10 a.m. as she shares about herself and where her life with Jesus has taken her. Bring a brunch dish to share as we enjoy some time together. We'd also like to bless Austin and Madison by filling their pantry and welcome you to bring us pantry staple to contribute. That's it for this week's announcements. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week online at firstaztec.org and on social media. We believe God has something to say to you, and our hope is that you feel his love stronger than ever before. You picked a great day to be here, and welcome home. Morning. 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 Check. Matt. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Um, welcome to First Baptist Church Aztec. If you're looking for Deborah, <laughs> she's not here. So you can say hi. Hi, Deborah. We miss you. Come back now. 
I'm just kidding. Um, she baby. she's in you know in her grandbaby therapy right now. Yeah. So I need you all guys to stand up and worship with us today. Roy. If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles. You've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies. If you're trying to fill the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. You need freedom for saving. He's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. We've all run the things we know that just ain't right. When there's a better life, there's a better life. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom to save it. He's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. If you believe in, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. If you believe it, if you receive it. Can't feel it. Somebody testify. You got pain. He's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom, save him. He's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. If you got pain. He's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains. He's a chain breaker. I'm going to welcome um, Jason, Jason and Redina <laughs> to lead us in prayer and the scripture read reading. So we're going to be in Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Nice. <laughs> All right. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is in your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is in all. Mm. 
Christ is all and is in all. Mm -hmm. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with <coughs> compassion, <coughs> kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Let's pray. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just love you, Lord, mm -hmm. and we thank you for this opportunity that we get to gather here to sing and praise and worship you, Father. Father, we, we just want to ask that you fill this church and, and Mike with the Holy Spirit this morning as he speaks your message. And Father, just uh, soften the hearts this week as we go out. I want to put a prayer out for the, the youth group, for uh, White Out, Lord, and for the women's IF conference and the men's retreat, Lord, that you just help us to be bold and courageous, help us to step out of our comfort zone and invite others to, to experience your love and your grace, Lord. And Lord, we love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
you a question and it's probably going to sound like a challenge and it is because you've heard it before some of your best buds that used to run with you know the pack they probably ask you why do you go to that church why do you talk about that Jesus dude see they don't know better to rever his holy name but they ask you this in a challenge 
So my question to you is, well, what's your answer to that? How do you testify? How do you testify about Jesus? Why do you come to this church and sing songs that proclaim, I fall on my knees, but we don't fall on our knees. I raise my hands, but we don't raise our hands. Hmm. I stand and worship you, God, the creator of all things. But we don't stand. Challenge. See, because there was a man who one day looked to heaven and he saw an ocean part and he and his entire nation walked across on dry ground. And he had something to say about that. Hallelujah. And there was a lady who was walking alongside in a funeral possession, alongside her son who was being carried because he was dead. And Jesus walked by. And as Jesus touched the boy, he came back to life. Now, he was a little bit dumbfounded, a little kind of like my eighth grade students. For a little bit while, he was confused because he's coming back to life. But mom is dancing and praising and testifying, Jesus can raise the dead. Amen. That's right. And there was another lady who was heavy in burden and heavy in shame. And, and all Jesus did was write in the sand a little bit. Mm -hmm. And the rocks started to drop all mm -hmm. around her. I, I could just imagine what that sound is like in sand. And when the last one hit the ground, then Jesus looked up at her. He said, where's your accusers? Yeah. And she says, I have to testify. There are none. And Jesus said, go and sin no more. And shame was lifted off her shoulders. And I'm sure she told all of her friends, I don't feel that guilt anymore. Jesus! And in this room, there are some who have said that. Because by all statistics... They and their whole family shouldn't even be on this planet anymore. There are some in this room who God have, has healed from cancer, who has mended broken hearts, who has raised people literally from the brink of falling over into death, who has restored marriages. We can't say hallelujah. Then let me challenge you with this. The ones that could praise are the ones that knew Jesus. My best friend Daniel, we had a conversation early this week. Sunday, he told me that uh, he had COVID last Sunday. It's from Amarillo. And so on Monday at 11.15, I'm going to give it to you just the way it is here in the text. At 11.15 in the morning, I texted him. I told him, I'm praying you all are healing well. Keep me posted. And he called me almost immediately. And we talked for a good while. And he was having a hard time speaking. And I told him, just, 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 just hold it, Daniel. And here's what you need to know about Daniel. He and I would t often talk. And when we talked, it was always about the Lord. Yeah, we, we sat over some food and enjoyed and mmmed and gnawed the food and, and talked about different things and, and the climate and the weather and, and politics. But it always came back to the Lord. And Daniel always had this saying, God is good. And I've got to tell you, when he would say that, because I would say it as well. I said, yes, he, God is good. But when he would say it to me, and this is what friends should do for friends in testimony, it was like the Holy Spirit was moving through me when he would say those words. Because he knew God. He knows Jesus. And so we prayed. 
I said, Daniel, rest and let the doctors take care of you as best as they can. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of comfortable. I said, I said, but just rest. And later that night, 7 o'clock on Monday night, I texted him. I said, when I went through COVID last year, some of you have heard this, I let myself fall, just fall into God's hands, and here's what came of it. And I titled it, This I Know. Five points. I said, one, I know that God is God. Two, I know that God is a good God. Three, I know that God loves me. Four, I know that God will never leave me. He will never forsake me. And five, I know that because of God, I fear nothing, including death, even dying alone. Daniel, my brother, God's got you right in the center of his loving hands and nothing he will, nothing will happen to you that he doesn't allow. He always plans and works for our good. I love you, my brother. This is what I know of Daniel. Broken hips, broken shoulders, diabetes, COPD throughout his life. He had one eye that since childhood just didn't work right. Never did marry. He's exactly as old as I am. Lived alone a lot of his life. His response to me that night, Monday night, that's awesome. I believe it. I receive it. Thank you. Love you, bro. Give me any prayers. And I texted back, praying hard, my brother. The next morning at 1035 on his phone, I got this text. Jarrell. This is Corrine, his sister. I just want to let you know that my brother passed away this morning. It happened very quickly. Daniel was before the father. But before he left, he got on his knees and he worshiped God. Before he left, he raised his hands to God. And now he sees Jesus face to face. Praise God. And I'm testifying because he can't be here that God is good. Amen. And if he's good, shouldn't we raise our voice to him in praise? Shouldn't we give him all the glory from our bottom of our hearts? Oh, that we would be shamed to praise any sport or anything else in this life more than we praise God. Let us praise Him this morning. Because you see, when your friends ask you, why do you go there? You know what they're really saying? Is what we've been singing about with the scriptures we read about this morning. I tried the world. Mm -hmm. Do you think I should try that? And your response to them will make the difference. Are you going to testify about Jesus and how good he is? And if you are, let's practice together here where it's safe. Because one of these days, sometime this year, some of us are not going to be here. But you're going to be standing in front of God Almighty. And you'll get to see him face to face in all his glory. But please don't get there with any regret of saying, Jesus, I should have praised you more. Jesus, I know my voice wasn't that great, but I could have sung to you at the top of my voice. I could have testified more about you, Lord. This morning, worship him in that manner glorify him in that manner and if you can't because you're saying I don't even understand what you're saying hold on you're going to get your chance to know him and you then can walk out of this church saying God 
it is good. Let us sing. Let us sing. Jesus, we sing to you this morning. Jesus, we raise our voice to you this morning. Lord God, for saving us. Lord Father, give us our own story to be able to testify about. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Let us worship. Let us praise him this morning. Stand and worship him. Raise your hands and worship him. Bow down and worship him. Kneel, bend your heart and your will to him in worship and in adoration. Amen. Amen. Oh uh-huh. 
Heavenly Father, here we are today, oh God. With everything that we have, Jesus. Some of us are burdened. Some of us are, are joyful. Some of us are just neutral. But Lord, here we are. Here we are gathered right now. And we believe, Lord, that you've called us to be here. You've called us to gather as a family, to exalt your name alone, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Worthy. Worthy of all the praises, of all the adoration, of all the worship, oh God. And Lord, as we sing this song, Father, help us to pour out our hearts to you, oh God. The one true God. Jesus, you're worthy. Worthy of all the praise. You're worthy. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. 
trust in him, you won't be shaken because you're not relying upon yourself. That's what causes us to fail in the first place. But we're putting our faith in him. All of our trust is in him. It's his reputation. And he can take care of that because he is a good God. Pray with me, Jesus. From this day forward, may we put our trust in you and only in you. To lean on you daily, Lord. To grow in you daily. To be renewed by you daily. Our foundation will be your love. Therefore, whatever concept we have of love goes out the door. We take on your love. Lord, we will reach our neighbors like you want us to do effectively because we go in your love. Teach us daily, Lord God, to trust in you. Amen. Praise the Lord. The goodness of God. Would you uh, mind expressing your appreciation to Miss Stephanie Faith, please? Boy, I appreciate her. Wow. Uh, it is amazing. Miss Deborah is uh, off, uh, I don't know, licking grandbabies, you know, doing... <laughs> Smothering, smothering them with kisses and love and all that stuff. And so uh, I really appreciate a, a team like we have that can just continue on and go, Deborah who? I mean, that's just a, and just keep pressing straight on. And so, <laughs> and so we really appreciate you as a team. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Stephanie Faith. And yes, Miss Deborah, we do miss you and we love you. Uh, but you don't expect a, not to receive a hard time. So... Thank you, church, for being here, worshiping the Almighty King this morning. Thank you. Today, as we dive back into the book of James, we begin, re-begin, restart this series with a message titled, How Not to Be Embarrassed About Your Relationship with Jesus. You can see it on the screen. How Not to Be Embarrassed About Your Relationship with Jesus. Please open your Bibles with me to the book of James, chapter 1. Verses 26 and 27, James 1, 26, 27. As you're finding that, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been embarrassed about being a follower of Christ? I mean, really, seriously. Have you ever just been, you, you've been with friends, you've been with family, you've been with strangers, you've been in some situations that you just go, yeah, I really didn't want anyone to know I was a follower of Christ at this moment. That would have been really embarrassing. Raise your hand if that's true. Come on. We have, a, we have some honest folks in the church. Good deal. Because I'm in that crowd. I'm in that crowd. Uh, maybe maybe you, you were talking with someone. Maybe it's even happened this year. It's still January, still the first month. Maybe it's happened in recent weeks or days or months. And you were visiting with someone. And you think to yourself, which really wasn't you thinking. It was the Holy Spirit speaking to you. But you were thinking to yourself... I need to pray with this person right now. And then the other side steps in, the fleshly side, the, the evil spirits, and they go, yeah, you don't need to pray with them. What would they think of you? What would they say? They're going to think you're weird. Matter of fact, if you volunteer to pray with them right now, it's going to turn them off. And all of a sudden you become embarrassed that you actually even wanted to pray with someone. You been there? I've been there. It's that tension. It's that struggle. Maybe witnessing, maybe, maybe inviting someone to Sunday school. You're talking to someone and you're like, man, they would be perfect for me to invite to a Sunday school class or a Wednesday night class or a Sunday night class or to worship service. And then all of a sudden you go, but what would they think? What if they tell me no? Ever been there? Yeah. If we're honest, I believe if you're, if you're honest and you're a follower of Christ, I believe all of us would go, yeah, 
been there, had that embarrassment, either pushed through or backed off. So when was the last time that happened? Without answering that out loud, please, when was the last time that happened to you? When was the last time that you felt embarrassed about being a follower of Christ? Well, this morning, I believe that we will be either reminded or perhaps learn for the first time how we can keep from being embarrassed about being a follower of Christ. Now, we're not going to touch on everything we could touch on in this subject. We're going to stay with our text, but I really believe there's some tools here that you can put to work in your life. If you have found James chapter 1, verse 26, say, I got it. Good job. The Word of God reads, those who considered themselves, now read it slow with me, those who considered themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves. And their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Would you pray with me, please? And just as a reminder, when one person is praying out loud, what, what do the rest of us do? We all pray. Good job. Let's talk to the Father together. Oh, God, we thank you and we praise you for your word. We thank you and we praise you, Father, for the truths of the songs we just finished bringing before your throne. And we ask, Lord, that you would continue to speak to us. We're, we are surrendering our minds, our wills, our hearts to you, Almighty God, even right now, and saying, God, speak to us. We want to hear from you. Teach us truths, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, and so that the name of your Son, Jesus, will become more and more famous throughout this region. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. So the text says those who consider themselves religious. Well, you're here on a Sunday morning. You just finished Sunday school and you're here in big church. You might label yourself as religious. You might. And that's okay. That's not a bad thing. But I want us to understand we can be religious about all sorts of stuff. We can be religious about, well, it's, it's football season. We can be religious about football. Matter of fact, we can be religious about a certain team in football. We can be so religious that we do not want to miss a game. We don't want to miss a, a minute of any game. It is so important because why? It is our religion. We religiously follow a team. We religiously follow a sport. Some people can be so religious about a football team that it's like uh, the wife goes, hey, I'm in labor. I need to go to the hospital now. Honey, hold it together. The game's not over. <laughs> That's religion. Okay. You're, 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 you're deep entrenched in this religion at that point. You're also probably dead, but you're, 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 you're focused. And we can become that focus on our job. Our job can, we, can become a religion. Our, our, our family can become a religion. Our, our children, our grandchildren, our hobbies, anything that we elevate, anything that we devote our lives to, anything that we esteem more than anything else, becomes our religion. And it's like from time to time, we look inside of our heart and we go, God, I need you to step off of my throne because I need this to take, its, take your place for a little while. 
Now, some of us might find that offensive. Well, I would never do that. Well, but we do it. We do it. Our religion reflects who we are and whose we are. Some people in, in sports, when it comes to sports, some people are mere fans. In other words, they only follow that team as long as they're winning. You know anybody like that? Baseball, football, basketball, uh, surely not tennis, right? I mean, that's just like a boing, 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 boing. And it's like, whoa, okay. But some people follow sports only as long as their team is winning. Some people only have that job as their religion only if they're climbing the ladder or they feel successful. And the moment they stop feeling successful in their job, they're no longer a fan of that. It's no longer a religion. They actually speak against it and they speak foul against it. And they go, wow, who could ever want a job like this? I hate this job because they aren't winning anymore. Does our religion with Christ look like that? It can. As long as things are going our way, as long as our bank account is good, as long as our spouse is happy with us, as long as things are as they quote unquote should be for us, then we elevate Christ and our religion is all in shape and good. But the moment things begin to fall apart, or we have a spout with our wife, or the finances aren't what they should be, or the job's not happy, or the kids are now ugly and bad, and all of a sudden, our religion goes out the window. You ever known anybody like that? Before you point outward, you got to make sure you point inward, all right? Because I think we've all been there. Are we only Christ followers when it benefits us? Are we only religious when it comes to Christ when we can see the positive fruit bearing that happens? Well, let's ask it even a harder way. What do our lips reveal? You guys have stopped smiling and you've gotten quiet. What, what do our lips reveal? You see, James states it states that if we fail to control our tongue, our religion, or what we say we believe about God is not true. James says that if we fail to control our tongue, our religion, or what we say we believe about Jesus, what we say we believe about the Holy Spirit is not true. Look at the text, verse 26. Those who consider themselves religious yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, deceives themselves. What, have you ever, let's talk about controlling the tongue for just a moment. And some of you would go, well, let's don't. Yeah, no, we, we've got to. Have you ever known someone that felt like they needed to talk? Again, don't point and don't whisper names. Have you ever known that person? Man, they have so many words and they just got to talk all the time. And their talk is usually about their own drama or their own life issues. And they just need to talk a lot. All the time. <laughs> Constantly. The more we talk, often is the more we end up sticking our foot in our own mouth and becoming embarrassed. The book of Proverbs has a lot to say about this, and there's so many, but hold your place in James, if you would. Hold your place in James. I want you to go to Proverbs chapter 10, and we're not going to look at all that I have researched and looked up. We're just going to look at a few of the verses, but Proverbs chapter 10 is where I'd like for us to begin, and as soon as you got it, say, I got it. And if you find yourself here this morning, this Sunday morning, while you're turning to Proverbs chapter 10, if you find you're here on this, on this Sunday morning and you go, you know, I don't really read the Bible during the week, let me encourage you. Read the book of Proverbs. You say, well, how do I start? Where do I go? 
Today's date is the 23rd. Double check myself. It's the 23rd. So this afternoon, when you're at home or tonight before you go to sleep, whatever, you would open your Bible and you'd read Proverbs 23. Next, next tomorrow, you'd read Proverbs 24. And the day goes on and every day. There's 31 Proverbs. And when the months there aren't 31 days, just those other books, just don't worry about them. Just go back to day one on February 1 and continue that process. It's, it's a great way to read the Word of God. It, it, it works, and God will speak to you. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 18. Do you got it? That's still not really strong, guys. Proverbs 10, verse 18. Here's what the Word of God reads. Whoever conceals hatred with lying lips and spreads a slander is a what? Ouch. You see how the tongue is involved in all that? Verse 19. Sin is not ended by multiplying words. Isn't that funny? Now don't, don't skim past that. Don't, sin is not ended. In other words, sin is actually multiplied. If you read what he's saying, sin is actually multiplied with our many words. The more we speak, the more sin's going to happen. But the prudent hold their what, church? But the prudent hold their tongues. The tongue, verse 20, the tongue of the righteous is choice silver, but the heart of the wicked is of little value. James is saying that, or J James is saying exactly what the Proverbs is saying to us. Our tongue reveals what's in the heart. Verse 21, the lips of the righteous nourish many, but fools die for lack of sense. My dad, my dad used to say something along this line when I was a little boy. And I was very rambunctious little boy. I'm so much calmer today than I used to be, trust me. When I was a, a little boy, my dad would say something like this, Michael, if you keep your mouth shut, people will think you're smart. <laughs> That'd usually be followed by a gib slap with that English, you know, right on the back of the head or the seat of the pants, whichever is needed at the time, right? Just boom. Michael, yes. Proverbs 11, verse 9. So scroll your fingers down just a little bit further. Proverbs 11, verse 9. With their mouths, the godless destroy their neighbors, but through knowledge... The righteous escape. Scroll down to verse 12, 9, 12, Proverbs 9, 12. Whoever derides their neighbor has no sense, but the one who has understanding, what do they do with their tongue? They hold it. I, I, if, if we could just... If we could just stay in Proverbs and read only the, the, the Proverbs, the verses that have to do with the tongue, we would be here for a very long time. The Proverbs is full of it. And guess what it says time and time and time again? Shh, don't talk. You can walk around with your mouth shut and make people think you're really smart, or you can open it up and, mm, yeah. And there's so many more Proverbs that we could go to, but controlling our tongue also means controlling what our heart focuses on. My friends, if we fail to control what we focus on, we are deceiving ourselves. And we end up being embarrassed about Jesus. You see, oftentimes the reason we're embarrassed to invite someone to Sunday school, oftentimes the reason we're embarrassed to invite someone to a, 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 a Sunday night or a Wednesday night study or invite them to worship with us, is because what our mouth has said in other instances. And we take that and, and the, the enemy uses that in our brain and in our heart because we go, how can, I, how can I invite them to worship with me when I've talked like this? How can I invite them to a Sunday school class or a discipleship class? I would be embarrassed. 
Jesus teaches us, and we're going to turn there to Matthew chapter 12. Turn there with me if you would. Matthew chapter 12, verse 33. Jesus teaches us that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Another way to word that is, the heart is the motor of the tongue. And that just hit me. Somebody write that down for me because that's really good. The heart is the motor of the tongue. Matthew chapter 12, verse 33. If you got it, say, I got it. Uh, 33. Matthew 12, verse 33. The word of God reads, make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. Now, church, this is what James is saying to us. In James chapter 1, that's what James is saying to us. You, your tongue reveals what's inside of you. It reveals your religion. That's what James is saying to us. Look what Jesus says, verse 34. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. If you really want to fix your tongue, fill your heart with Jesus. Fill your heart with the Word of God. Fill your heart by being around other Christians, other Christ followers that are eagerly and hungrily pursuing a deeper relationship with Him. Your heart will be filled with the things of God, not the things of the world, and the fruit of that will be seen by your lips. Verse 35, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. Was it an amen or an oh me? Yeah, I think that's an oh me for me. We got to give an account for every empty word spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted. And by your words, you will be condemned. That's not talking about our salvation, but it is talking about bearing fruit and that judgment that we will have before the throne of God for the works that we did, for every word that is spoken. What are we filling our hearts with? My friends, it will eventually come out of our mouths. How do we keep ourselves from being embarrassed about our relationship with Jesus? Well, James makes it very clear. Stop deceiving ourselves and control our tongues. Second, James tells us, keep our relationship with God pure and faultless. Look at it. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless. My friends, we should strive to do this. The, the question is, do we strive? Seriously, it's a great question. Do we strive to keep our, 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 our religion pure and faultless? Like gold that has been purified, the dross goes to the top and the good stuff's at the bottom and they scoop that bad stuff off so what you have left is pure gold. Do we strive to live a life that is pure and faultless or does it ever even cross our minds? Other than on Sunday morning, of course. Because on Sunday morning is when the answer is God, Jesus, Holy Spirit. That's the answer, right? That's, a, that's the safe Sunday school answer. If you go to Sunday school and your teacher asks a question, you can say, God, you will not be wrong. <laughs> you might be able to say Jesus or the Holy Spirit and not be wrong too, because you know, they kind of one, they're hard to separate. 
But I digress. Keep our relationship with God pure and faultless. Simply put is this. When you and I do not live out what we say we believe, our words become empty. When we do not live out what we say we believe, our words become hollow. They have no depth. And our witness before, before others becomes worthless. We need to strive to make our words match what we say and believe about several things. I've got a few listed here. The first one. Strive to make our words match what we say we believe about the sovereignty of God. Jarrell did that a while ago. Lost a close friend. He's in heaven. Didn't lose him. He knows exactly where he's at. He's not lost. Isn't that a weird statement? I'm sorry for your loss. Well, you don't know where they're at. I know where they're at. They're in heaven. They're not lost. I'll get to see him one day. I'm going there. You want to go with me? Trust what we say we believe about the sovereignty of God. What does that mean, sovereignty of God? That God is holy, God is just, God is all-knowing, God is all-seeing, God is everywhere. There's nothing that escapes God's grasp. Do our words match what we say we believe? Secondly, do our words match what we say we believe about the love of God? That God is... His love is without measure. We can't measure how deep or how wide or how long or how, how we, we, can't, we can't fully wrap our head around the love of God because He is so loving. Do our words match what we say we believe about the goodness of God? Do our words match what we say we believe about the joy and peace that is found in our relationship with God through Jesus? In other words, if people were to have to give a report or an account on your life over this past week, would people say that you walked in the joy and the peace of Jesus by your actions and by your words? I'm not talking about on Sunday morning. I'm talking about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And maybe even Sunday night late as you're laying your head on your pillow and you're considering what this world has for you this coming week. Do your words and your actions match the joy and peace that you say is found in our relationship with God through Christ? The last one. Do, do our words match what we say we believe about our church family? That our church family is unified that we walk as one, that we are more than ready to work arm in arm, hand in hand with anyone here, without reservation, without hindrance. Do we love one another that deeply that we are ready to go to bat for any one of us at the drop of a hat? Do our words and actions match what we say we believe about our church family? You see, if not, our religion is worthless. Let's keep pressing. We need to put our religion to work. What we say and what we believe about God must be put to work. We need to, we, we must. We must keep ourselves in a position before Jesus, before others, that we are not embarrassed about our relationship with Jesus. Verse 27, James 1, 27, the religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from becoming polluted by the world. What, Jesus, what, what James is saying, and God has led him to say this, that's why it's included in the canon, that's why it's included in the, in the Bible. These are words from God himself. These, these are, this is part of God's love letter written to us. If we really want 
our religion to be pure and faultless, we need to emphasize our ministry to orphans and widows and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Invest our time, invest our prayers in those three things. Now, I am not talking about First Baptist Church Aztec. What am I not talking about? Okay, about three of you got it. I am not talking about First Baptist Church Aztec. What I am talking about is ministry organizations as a whole. That's what I'm about to talk about, ministry organizations as a whole. It is virtually impossible to go to a Christian concert and not hear about how you can send your money to help orphans overseas. It, there are so many organizations that are leading Christians to spend three, four, five thousand, six thousand dollars to go overseas and minister to widows and orphans. I'm not talking about First Baptist Church Aztec. I'm talking about ministry organizations as a whole. Because you could Google, don't do it right now, but you could Google later ministries to widows and orphans, and you would have a list that you could choose from. There are so many. And maybe I am just way too simple. Probably. Probably. I am way too simple. But I believe I could walk out that door take a right, stop, get a cup of coffee, and then go out the door and walk down the street in just about any direction from our church and find widows and modern-day cultural orphans. And I could take my three, four, five, six thousand dollars and invest in ministry right here in Aztec, right here in this region, this region that God has planted this church. As a church, we are reaching out to many modern day orphans. Now follow me, stay with me. In our culture today, there are many orphans all around us. Some of these orphans have one parent in the home. Some of these orphans have two parents in the home. And yet they have no real mom or dad. They have no real parental figure in their life. They have no structure. Now, I am not coming down on those parents. Please hear me carefully. You can rewind the tape and watch it again later if you want. But I want to be heard. Due to addictions, these parents may not know how to parent their children and so their children are raised with a single parent or two parents in the home, and they are still raised as orphans. They don't know how to raise kids. This does not make them bad people. Perhaps they have never been taught how to parent. Have you ever met a parent that's never been taught how to parent? Raise your hand for me. I'll, that's the majority of us. Wow. It doesn't make them bad people. It makes them a, a word in the English language that is used in, in, derogatory, in derogatory ways, but it shouldn't be because what it means is unlearned, and that word is ignorant. They are ignorant because they've never been taught how to be a parent, how to raise children. Their parents 
didn't, may have not known how to raise kids. And so then we're dealing with a third generation of a mom and dad that had kids biologically possible and still not be able to parent. And then these passed on exactly what they knew, which was nothing about parenting. Now, all of a sudden you've got three generations in a community and they're going, we don't know any better. We don't know what to do. And you've got three generations of orphans, cultural, modern day orphans that are right here in our region. You and I make a difference in their lives as we reach out to them. We have some in our church. This very week, we will have some modern day orphans in our church. I state that, and I state that as a declaration because we have them every week. We do. God has entrusted this church with modern day cultural orphans. And we must accept them and we must love them. When they come in on Wednesday nights, when they come in for Sunday school on Sunday morning, when they come in for worship on Sunday morning, when they come in for discipleship on Sunday evenings, as a church, we have this huge opportunity that God has given us. And we do one of two things. We either go, yeah, too much work for me. I'm going to go over here where it's easy. Or we say, you know, I don't know that student, child, kindergarten through 12th grade. I don't know that person. I'm going to stop and say hi to them, find out their name. Every one of us could do that. And share with them my name. Ask them the simple questions. Have you been attending here long? First time I've got to meet you. And we show them acceptance and we show them love as we do that. My friends, God continues to entrust us with people that have never been churched before. They do not have the same mores. They do not have the same values. They don't have the same boundaries that perhaps you were raised with. Some, some of our students have mom and dads that are followers of Christ. Hallelujah. Some of our students have that. And, the, and they're already, some of, those, some of our students are already saved. And if that's you, and you're a first through 12th grader, and you're here in this room right now, I'm going to tell you something. So listen very carefully, please. This is your pastor loving on you and talking to you, Zach Sanders. Listen, God has entrusted you as a student at First Baptist Church Aztec to take these modern day orphans and to influence their lives for the kingdom of God. And I'm talking to the students. Because you see, when it comes to orphans that have no boundaries, they have no mores, they have no values like we do because we're raised in a Christian home, those orphans can actually change our culture. Those orphans can actually change who we are, how we act, how we respond. We have a choice. You see, parents... Parents that are raising these children who are already saved and they're bringing them to church, I applaud you. What you have done is you have baked a spiritual cake at home and you bring it to church to be iced. And the icing is the fun part, right? I love the icing. Baking the cake happens at home. All the ingredients to have a healthy child happens at home, not at church, unless you're a spiritual orphan, a modern day orphan, and then we become parental figures 
who try to do both. At the same time, we impact the parents, trying to reach them for the kingdom of God. You see, God has entrusted us with people all around us. They may not act like us. They may not talk like us. They may not live in a house like us. They may not have the clothes like we have. But God is giving us an opportunity to show them by our example how to live. Do you realize that there are students who, who feel like GD is just a common word? It's, a, it's, a, it's just another verb, adverb, adjective. It, they were raised with those words being commonplace for them. And if you're offended by your pastor saying the two initials GD in church, you need to get a life. Because we live around people that that is a very common phrase. I'm not saying anything that you don't already know. And I'm saying all of this in love. Please hear me. I love you. And I love this church and I'm glad I'm your pastor. I want us to do what the Bible says, reach the modern day orphans that are all around us. Did you all know that we called a student minister recently? What's his name? Austin Cannon. I'm so excited they're coming. Aren't you? In case you didn't know, Austin doesn't have any tool in his toolbox that's going to fix your kids nor any kids in this community. He does not. Austin doesn't have some magic globe that he's going to pull out and be able to direct the stars and align things up so that your child now behaves. Or someone else's child now behaves. Because the cake is made where? The cake is made at home. We come here to add the icing. But I'll tell you what Austin does have. Austin and Madison have the Holy Spirit living inside of them. Austin and Madison, Madison's his wife, Austin and Madison have a zeal and an excitement to reach 6th through 12th graders with the gospel of Jesus Christ. They have a passion for reaching their lost parents and bringing them into the life of the church. They have a passion for that. I'll tell you what else they have. They have a church family that's not going to push Austin and Madison and say, go get them, tiger. Mm -mm. That's not what they have. They have a church family that's going to go before them, that's going to walk beside them, and that's going to be behind them, having their back, as they follow God's leadership in doing ministry in this region. That's what they have. Amen? Because... If Austin comes here and fails, we have failed as a church. If Austin comes here and succeeds, what happens? As a church, for the glory of the kingdom of God. You see, his success or failure is not really on him. It's on us. Oh, he'll do his part. He'll do his part. He has a loving pastor to help encourage him in that area. But we have to do our part. And that is for every student. And that's for every parent. And that's for every grandparent. And that is for every single that we have in the life of this church. We will all come together and do our part to see wins for the kingdom of God. You see, one of the, something that God spoke to me this morning as I drove in, and I wanted to jump out of my car and do a dance, but I didn't. It's too cold. Is my prayer has been a tad wrong. My prayer has been that we would reach this region for the kingdom of God. 
And this is what God said to me this morning as I drove in praying. It's not about reaching them, it's about winning them. And I, in my heart, there's a difference. You can reach people for a meal, you can reach people for a good time, you win them for the kingdom of God. Now I want you to turn one more place and we're wrapping up. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. 1 Corinthians 9, 19. As soon as you got it, say, I got it. Come on, turn there quickly. 1 Corinthians 9, 19. And I want you to notice in this the word win. And if you would, I would encourage you to underline every time you see the word win. W I N. 1 Corinthians 9, 19. If you got it, say, I got it. Though I am free and belong to no one, Paul says, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews who become like a Jew, to do what? To win the Jews. To those under the law, I become like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I become like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I become weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Being faithful to what the Father has entrusted us with our religion, with our tongue, with the cultural modern day orphans. And we haven't even touched widows and we're not going to this morning. Will we be found faithful when Jesus returns? Will we be found faithful with everything that the Father has entrusted to us? Or will we walk around polluted by the world? You see, that's what it says at the end of that. To look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. I came across a story this week I'm going to share with you. The story goes like this. A well-known golf professional golfer was playing a tournament with President Gerald Ford and uh, that would be about the time James Lackey turned 60, I think. So He was playing a golf tournament with President Gerald Ford and fellow pro Jack Nicklaus and an evangelist by the name of Billy Graham. After the round was over, one of the other pros on the tour said, Hey, what was it like playing golf with the president and Billy Graham? Here's the pro's response. He said with disgust, I don't need Billy Graham stuffing his religion down my throat. With that, he headed over to the practice tee, and his friend followed him over. As the professional golfer pounded with fury an entire bucket of golf balls downrange, his friend said, So, uh, was Billy a little rough on you out there? The golf pro sighed and with embarrassment responded, No, he didn't even mention religion. Astonishingly, Billy Graham had said nothing about God, nothing about Jesus, nothing about church, nothing about religion, yet the golf pro stomped away after the game, accusing Billy Graham of trying to ram religion down his throat. What had happened was simply this. 
the evangelist had so reflected Christ's likeness that his very presence brought the same feeling onto the golf pro as Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 6, I am a lost man with unclean lips living among a people of unclean lips. The life of Billy Graham brought the lost pro into the presence of a holy God. There is nothing that Billy Graham had that you and I do not have. We have access to all spiritual gifts through the power of the Holy Spirit. He will give them as he deems right and correct. We have the same Holy Spirit living within us that Billy Graham had living within him. This world-renowned evangelist. He was not embarrassed of his religion. He was not embarrassed about his relationship with Christ. But it was so entrenched, so baked in, if you would, that it just exuded out of him. Would the world say that to be true about us? That just being in your very presence, they feel convicted of their sin because of what the Holy Spirit is doing in you and through you. How not to be embarrassed about our relationship with Jesus? Control your tongue. Value. Value your relationship with God. Strive for it to be faultless. And look at what God has entrusted to us and make certain that we're being a great, not a good, but a great steward of it. Would you bow your heads with me, please? With your heads bowed, my question, have you, been, have you been embarrassed about your relationship with Christ? I don't want you to leave that way. I want you to leave renewed, refreshed, overflowing with the Holy Spirit. My question is, do you want that? Because if you leave filled, overflowing with the power of the Holy Spirit, you will push through what the enemy lays before you as embarrassment. You will have that ability to do so. Do you want it? And if you want it, ask for it right now. If you've been embarrassed, repent. Tell God, God, I repent of my embarrassment. I repent of not taking advantage of those situations, those opportunities. I turn away from that and I call it sin. I acknowledge God what it is. Tell him. Ask him, thank him for his forgiveness. And now ask him to fill you with his Holy Spirit so that when you walk out of here and you enter this new week, you will walk in the power that he has for you to walk in. I'm going to have friends over here on my left and on my right. If you would like to come and pray with someone, come to them. If you would like to know this Jesus that we've been singing about and talking about, would you come up and talk to one of these or myself? Come. They're going to be here in just a moment. They're going to be there on my left and on my right. If you would like to make this church your church home, come. If you just want to come and kneel here at this altar, come. Do business with God. He loves you. Father in heaven, as we respond to you publicly and unashamedly, be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, would you stand with me? And as you stand, would you come? Would you come quickly? Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run. The
for just a moment for me. Church, with your heads bowed, I want you to take just a moment. Think about, consider what the Spirit of God just said to you. What He has spoken to you through this worship service. not responding to a man if you respond publicly you are responding to the drawing of the Holy Spirit and the work that God is doing in your life so right now if you need to pray with someone you need to Ask Christ to come into your life and save you and be the boss of your life. You would like to walk out of here knowing that you've been forgiven of your sins. You would like to join this church and make this church your church home. You want to follow Christ in baptism. I'm going to ask everybody to keep their heads bowed. I'm asking you, would you step out and respond? Come to, come to myself, come to my people, my friends right here on my left or my right. And take them by the hand and say, hey, this is what I want to do. They will help you. You don't have to have the answers. We will walk through this together. But I'm going to ask everybody to keep their heads bowed. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond. Right now. Come quickly. Come quickly. Anyone else, come quickly. Heads are bowed. People are praying for you. We're waiting on you to step out.
Father, thank you for your goodness, for your faithfulness, for your love. Oh, Father, your love never, ever fails. In Jesus' name, amen. Remain standing for just a moment. I'm just going to remind us of a couple of things. First, let me say again, thank you for being here to worship this morning. What a great God we have. Amen. Amen. Tithing boxes are right over there, right back there in that corner and over here. You can also give online uh, through PayPal. Uh, Just be obedient to the Father. Don't just drop something in there and don't just click a button on a phone or on a computer when you give. Worship. Praise God. Express your dependency upon Him as you tithe. Uh, Tonight, we have discipleship classes and Wednesday night, of course, Four o'clock is a church business meeting. If you'd like to come back for that before discipleship classes, business meetings at four, discipleship at five. Next Sunday, January 30th, our church is going to take church on the road and we are going to Cortez. When I say we, there's no mouse, it's usins. (laughs) We are going to Cortez. Cortez is going to have the first baptism that they've had in eight or nine years or so. They're joining us online. That's why I'm saying hi to them right there. Uh, The first baptism they've had in eight or nine years is going to happen next Sunday night at 3.30. If 3.30 confuses you, it's 15.30, okay? If that makes it easier for you. 3.30 next Sunday, Cortez is when it starts. What time does it start? Not tonight. Next Sunday, 3.30. We're going to have baptism. We're going to to celebrate the Lord's Supper with them. Our praise team is going with us. And you guys are bringing some enchiladas and some tamales and some fried chicken because we're Baptists. You got to have a fried chicken in there somewhere. And they're going to have some food. We're going to have some food and we're going to have a potluck afterwards. 3.30 is the start time. You say, well, how long is all this going to last? Shorter than an NFL football game, all right? <laughs> uh, we, I'm, I'm, so just make plans to go with us, take some food with you, and it's going to be a fantastic time, all right? It's going to be a fantastic time. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I feel like I'm forgetting something. Did I say something for service that I haven't said yet? Ah, thank you. If you're a guest here with us today, I would love to take a moment and and meet you and give you a couple of gifts on behalf of the church. So if you're a guest here with us today, I'm going to be right outside those doors. And uh, the church wants to give you some gifts that I have the privilege of presenting to you. So please join me right there. I won't take much of your time. Be right there for just a moment. Come by, say hi, receive the gifts, get a face and a name together and uh, let you get on your way. All right. All right. Let's pray together. We'll be dismissed. Father, thank you that I get to be a part of such an awesome church family. God, thank you for what you're doing in this region. Thank you for those we have seen won. Thank you for those we are going to win. Because it's all about your kingdom. May we walk out of here and enter this week not embarrassed, but bold about our relationship with Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.